All right, so if we have any uh, participants coming into the meeting, that'll be fine. I will just go ahead and get started. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jackie Encinas, and I am the host for tonight's Water Science Research research session part two. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us today. And if you didn't get a chance to review the PowerPoint slides a moment ago, um, just a few key reminders. This session is being recorded. And if you don't want to appear in the recording, that's fine. We just then ask that you keep your video turned off. We also ask that uh, you please keep yourself muted during the presentation so that we make sure all of our attention is on our speakers. And if you have any questions during the presentations today, we ask that you just put them into the chat box um, and we'll have a time for questions here. And I'll go over how this um, research session will flow here in a moment, but I'll hand it over to my co-host. Hi everyone, my name is Cecilia and I'm also a program assistant with Georgia adopt -a stream and we just want to give you a brief rundown of the program before we start our lovely research session. Um, so if anybody here is unfamiliar, unfamiliar with Georgia adopt -a stream, it is a citizen science program that trains volunteers to monitor the water quality of Georgia's diverse waterways. We have an annual volunteer confer conference called Confluence, which you are a part of, so we thank you for joining us. Um, and yeah, we're very happy that you all are here. So I will go ahead and turn it back over to Jackie. Thank you, Cecilia. And yes, I forgot to mention too, um, that we will be having a kind of informal networking session at the end of our presentations today. Uh, so if you want to stick around with us um, for about 15 or so minutes afterwards, we'll have a, a prize drawing and also just a chance to um, network with one another. Um, and I am going to give a little warning ahead of time. There are a line of thunderstorms coming through the area for uh, both Cecilia and I. Um, so we will cross our fingers that our connections are nice and secure. Um, but if we do cut off for any particular reason, we'll try our best to get the Zoom back up and running um, in the hour. So without further ado, we'll begin part two of our water science research session. So a little bit about this session. This is a unique and special opportunity for students and volunteers to share their water science and citizen monitoring projects with the rest of the adopt -a stream community. So tonight we are joined by three different presenting um, presenters and we are gonna be hearing a variety of topics, including uh, how properties of cigarette butts influence the quality of fresh and salt water, the chemical effects of schools reopening on a uh, Alatuna Creek, and microplastics quantifying the number of microplastics in point and non-point sources of pollution in Metro Atlanta. So these sessions are formatted like speed rounds. So each presenter will have about 10 minutes to share their research with everyone. And then we will give about five minutes after each presentation for questions. So that's your time, the audience, to um, either put in your questions into the chat, or you're also welcome to unmute yourself or, or turn on your video and ask your questions directly to our speakers. All right. Uh, so let me see. Great. Okay. Our first presentation for tonight is Latosha Walker, and she entered on the undergraduate level and is affiliated with Georgia Aquarium. Uh, so Latosha, you're a co-host, so you should have the ability to share your screen and whenever you're ready, you can begin your presentation. Hi everybody, my name is Latasha Walker. Um, can everyone see everything okay? Yes, we can see it. Okay, so this was a lab project that I did 
um, at, the, at Georgia Aquarium, and it was on how properties of cigarette butts influence the quality of fresh and salt water systems. So a little background about cigarette butts. The most common cigarette brands found on beach cleanups included Marlboro, Camel, and Cool. The main effect of cigarettes on the water systems is the creation of a leachate through the cellulose acetate from the cigarette butt interacting with water. And the only interesting thing that I can find on water chemistry background with cigarettes was that after an hour, the pH did not change in a freshwater system. At the Georgia Aquarium, there are a couple of standards for the salinity and pH for saltwater and freshwater systems. For saltwater systems, that will be 30 to 35 parts per thousand. Uh, freshwater systems are five parts per thousand or less. Uh, saltwater pH is 7.8 to 8.2 and freshwater is 6.5 to 7.2. So the objective of this project was to determine the effects of cigarette butts on water quality and fresh and saltwater systems. I hypothesize that the cigarette butts will alter water quality in both the freshwater and saltwater systems. So for my methods, I use the cool menthol long hard pack cigarettes as my main cigarette butt. I had four one gallon jugs in a fume hood that were separated into freshwater and saltwater systems. The freshwater cigarette system had two cigarette butts in it and the saltwater cigarette systems had four cigarette butts in them. In order to aerate the system, I had a air stone and an air pump um, connected. So for the project, it took me five weeks and I measured the water chemistry for four days out of each week. And the first measurement was taken after an hour of the cigarettes being saturated in the water. So I tested 10 water chemistry parameters, which included bromine, carbon dioxide, dissolved oxygen, nitrite, phosphate, ammonia, alkalinity, turbidity, pH, and salinity. So for my statistical analysis, I use SVSS statistical software, and I did two sample t-tests to determine the differences between the control and cigarette systems for the fresh and salt water. For bromine parameter, it remained in the non-detected range, so it was not analyzed using statistics. Um, additionally, the phosphate ammonia and freshwater nitrate um, distribution was not normal, so I could not analyze those as well. When I did the p-value for each two sample tests, I got three parameters that were significant, which is less than the 0.05 error value. That was turbidity saltwater, turbidity freshwater, and alkalinity freshwater. For freshwater alkalinity, you can see in the blue, the freshwater cigarette system has a greater average than the orange freshwater control system. So this higher alkalinity resulted in a stabilized pH, which could um, affect organisms that depend on a pH change for chemical cues for migration or other lifestyle needs. For turbidity, freshwater cigarette system in blue was also greater than the freshwater control system and same as the saltwater system was greater turbidity than the saltwater control system. So the turbidity de increased and the clarity decreased because of the leachate that was created from the cellulose acetate interacting with the water. And the leachate had a heavy metals in it, which was majorly cadmium and lead. However, in the saltwater systems, there was a greater clarity than the freshwater systems, and this was due to the sodium chloride in the saltwater system buffering those heavy metals, cadmium and lead, and the freshwater system was um, more sensitive to those heavy metals. With the decreased um, clarity in the water, this can affect photosynthetic, photosynthetic organisms because they will have less sun to absorb for 
their photosynthesis. And since there will be less photosynthetic organisms, this can create a bottom up disruption in the food web. For my conclusion, I accepted my hypothesis for turbidity because it changed in both the freshwater and the saltwater systems. There are only three parameters that changed um, due to the cigarettes, which was turbidity, freshwater, saltwater, and alkalinity, freshwater. For future research, I would like to combine the different brands that you can naturally see in the beach or other um, freshwater, saltwater systems because different brands have different nicotine levels and they have different heart heavy metal concentrations. I would also like to analyze the full nitrogen cycle to see if there's an increase or decrease in the transformation from ammonia to nitrate to nitrate. I'd also like to look at the effects of vegetation because of the turbidity being increased with the cigarettes. I want to see how that affects the photosynthesis by measuring in particular the chlorophyll A concentrations. Also, since this was a lab environment, I would like to test this in a natural system. And with the natural system, I want to measure different levels of heavy metals of low, medium, and high concentration to see if the heavy metals actually have an effect on the water chemistry. So for my acknowledgement, I would like to thank the Georgia Aquarium, mainly the water quality department that I did my summer internship with. And they helped me with my experimental design. They gave me materials and they gave me feedback. Um, do you have any questions for me? Great presentation, Latasha. If anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or you can unmute yourself to ask. I wanted to look at cigarettes just because I see a lot of cigarettes like on the side of the road, at the beaches. And I wanted to know if it actually had an effect on the system just because a lot of people will flick it out of their window or they'll throw it on the on the beach even though there are trash cans so i just it was just an interest to me thanks i had a quick question and i apologize if you clarified this and i just missed it but um i was wondering why you put two butts in the freshwater system and four in the salt water so this was based on the lethal concentration at 50 percent that was researched on the invertebrates and the vertebrates. So invertebrates had half, a, half of a cigarette butt for a gallon and vertebrates had eight cigarette butts for a gallon. And I just averaged that for the saltwater system, which was four. And I have that for the freshwater system as two because the saltwater, I wanted to mimic how the freshwater system outputs into the saltwater system. Gotcha, thank you. No, only cigarettes effect that was studied was on actual organisms and just the pH that I talked about in the background. Yes, the cigarette butts did have um, tobacco left over in the actual filter part of the cigarettes. That is what actually created the leachate from the cellulose acetate. Um, the cigarettes were smoked were um, pre-smoked cigarette butts that I used. I only used um, pre-smoked cigarette butts and it was determined that the unsmoked cigarette butts had a greater effect on um, organisms and uh, pH just because there's more cellulose acetate in the tobacco product left over versus it being smoked on the smoked cigarette, but, cigarette butts. Those are some great questions that came in. I, uh, I've only been, you know, really familiar of like the adverse effects or, you know, just cigarette butt litter because of you know, them being more of just like debris and getting ingested by animals. And um, I think it's really interesting that you really looked at more of like the chemical parameters of water quality um, to see, you know, what's 
what's really happening um, when these materials are just littered and end up in our in our water. So um, really interesting project. Nice. Thank you. And you only worked on it um, for a summer. Did you say it was a summer internship? Yes, it was a summer internship in 2018. So it was only five weeks long. Okay. And what um, did you come up with the project idea? Was this something that uh, your advisors um, gave to you? Or um, can you tell us a little bit about what made you interested in this? This was something that I had to really push because I really wanted to figure out what was going on because a lot of, like you said, a lot of information is known about organisms and, you know, organisms are in the water. So, you know, if you know what's going on with the water, then you can um, make a connection between um, what they're absorbing out of the water and into their system. Um, but they, there was a push to make me not do it, but I was just like, if I do this one, I will also do your other project that you want me to do. And they were like, okay, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> what was their reasoning for pushing against it? Um, because it wasn't, it was a water quality department. So they weren't really looking for cigarettes because it's not, they, they said that it was something, they wanted it to be like an education thing for um, the, the Georgia Aquarium. So I was telling them, oh, well, people smoke cigarettes, people that smoke cigarettes come to the aquarium. So, you know, they can see that what, what that is actually doing. So, you know, maybe they'll stop throwing them out the window or throwing them not in the trash can. So I, it was, it was, I'm glad that they let me do it. Um, but yeah, it was a push. Hey, I think this we're all is glad Mike. that you got to do it too and share your awesome research with us. So thank you. Thank you. I, I wanted to say something if, if you can hear. Yes. Um, yeah, it's a great project. I think this they can totally do something with the education on this because cigarette butts are the most littered item worldwide. And they, you know, this is really cool that you have that. Is your um, report or anything available? Yes, I've actually um, published, well, not really published, but self published it on ResearchGate. Um, so it can be found on my profile. You can also really just look up my name in Google, which is cool that I find that you'll, you'll find my profile on there. That is cool, Latasha. Thank you. Oh, hi, Miss Trish. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Do we have any other questions for Latasha? Oh, Sabrina has one here in the chat. So um, go ahead. Yeah, um, she said, how does the salt act as a buffer? So for the sodium chloride, it was determined that the cadmium had a, an interacted with the sodium chloride by decreasing, or the sodium chloride interacts with the cadmium by decreasing the cadmium concentration. So without the sodium chloride in the freshwater system, there was a greater cadmium con concentration that affected the turbidity. So with that salt, sodium chloride in that salt water system, it was able to decrease the cadmium concentration and increase the clarity, but not, um, it was still a significant difference between the control system. Any other questions? <laughs> uh, <laughs> comment. Uh, now she has some research to add to uh, her rant. <laughs> rant to people. Definitely. I think, I mean, yeah. I learned something new for sure. Um, so great project. Great job, Natasha. Thank you, guys. All right. Well, if there's no more questions, then we'll move on to our second presenter. So let me see our participant list. Oh, there she is. All right, let me make sure. 
that you can share your screen, Annabelle. Great. So our second presenter is Annabelle Stoltz, and she entered on the high school level with Kennesaw Mountain High School and also Cobb County Water Stewardship Program. So Annabelle, I'll give you the floor so that you can tell us about your research. Awesome, thank you guys. Okay, so um, good evening everybody. I am Annabelle Stoltz and last semester I researched the schools, um, the impact schools reopening had on Allatoona Creek. So to give a little background on my work, I interned at the Cobb County Watershed Stewardship Program under Mr. Mike Colley. Due to the current times, this internship was virtual. Um, I completed, but I did complete chemical and bacterial monitoring training, and I adopted four sites along Allatoona Creek. So you might be wondering, what is a watershed? I'm sure you all know, but um, I want you to picture the largest body of water in the world, and now think of the smallest. I thought of the Pacific Ocean and then a puddle, but they're both watersheds. A watershed is the um, land, rain, and water run through to, meet, uh, to reach a main body of water. However, there are very few healthy watersheds in the United States. All life depends on water for drinking, but water is also used for irrigation of our crops and recreational uses. Pollution is the main cause for um, unhealthy watersheds, and that raindrop that fell on your roof and um, traveled through your gutters and down the road picked up all, um, un all these unnatural substances with it that washed untreated into our creeks and rivers as well. So Cobb County lists <clears throat> Alatoona Creek as impaired due to little macroinvertebrate life in the creek. However, there's no obvious cause creating uninhabitable water. So this unique year provided the opportunity to evaluate schools effect on Alatoona Creek as they opened up partway through the semester. So my research also provides a baseline of data on Alatoona Creek since there's little knowledge of it. Alatoona Creek runs through Cobb County, but the three sites I researched ran behind three schools, Harrison High School, Lost Mountain Middle School, and Dominion Christian School. The site at Due West is upstream from the schools while Burnt Hickory is downstream. These sites allowed comparison of the water before and after crossing the schools. My main question during my research was what impact do schools have on the pollution of Alatoona Creek based off pH, dissolved oxygen, and conductivity? <clears throat> However, while reading background literature, um, I arrived at the second question of will the effect of schools reopening be noticeable as dissolved oxygen and conductivity changes with cooler temperatures? Um, I came to the hypothesis that pH and dissolved oxygen levels of Alatoona Creek will decrease while conductivity increases once schools open. So as I mentioned before, our watersheds are not healthy. In the Etowah River Shed specifically, 84% of the streams did not meet state water quality standards. In um, 2010, 37% of the land in Cobb County was developed. As I'm sure we all know, it seems that neighborhoods and buildings are popping up faster than we can blink. Um, but this isn't a fluke as Metro Atlanta is one of the fastest growing areas in the country. Urbanization unnaturally affects the pathways water once took in a watershed. So urban runoff is the main source of pollution as water travels over roads and parking lots and drainage systems. The drainage systems actually affect the pH of water. A study in 2010 showed that as concrete pipes, showed that concrete pipes made water more basic. However, creek water tested showed that there was no change in pH. This meant that the um, creek water was already contaminated <clears throat> with the use of concrete driveways, gutters, and parking lots. Impervious surfaces um, also collected fuels from vehicles as well as other spills like paint. The stormwater systems were made to quickly di um, divert, divert water off the road, but that water with the other pollutants washed untreated into our streams and lakes. So Alatoona Creek is not only exposed to roadways which cars travel over to get to school, but also the parking lots filled with the buses and cars every day. So dissolved oxygen is required for all aquatic life and is introduced through the atmosphere or by photosynthesis by aquatic plants. 
Dissolved oxygen has an inverse relationship with temperature since cold water has less molecular activity, meaning that the oxygen isn't pushed out between the water molecules. However, dissolved oxygen is an indicator of water quality. Bacteria is natural and consumes organic matter, but the large amount of bacteria due to excess organic matter is shown through a decrease in dissolved oxygen. The fertilizer that you add to your gardens also makes its way through the water, but it helps the aquatic plants grow. When they die, there's an excess of matter that the bacteria must consume, increasing the amount of oxygen consuming bacteria, decreasing the, the dissolved oxygen. A large amount of bacteria is also present with sewage leaks. So pH measures the acidity of the water. Ideally, Alatuna Creek should be a neutral pH of seven. At lower pHs, met metals are more soluble, which increases the toxicity of the water. Um, a healthy watershed should be able to buffer changes in pH to protect its aquatic life. So conductivity is the measure of ions in water. Temperature and pollution have a direct relationship with conductivity. Domestic and industrial waves, waste have very high amounts of salt, and warmer waters can dissolve minerals and salt much easier. Uh, fluctuation, fluctuations in conductivity is also an indicator of pollution. And macroinvertebrates are organisms visible to the naked eye without a backbone. Um, these are insects, worms, or mollusks. They are some of the organisms that derive their oxygen from water. Some are more sensitive to pollutants than others. A study in 2007 found that as sites become more developed, aquatic life becomes more homogeneous. So the number of pollutant tolerant macroinvertebrates are growing as the pollutant sensitive are declining. So the ecosystem is complex and both play their part. So a diverse number of species indicates a healthy watershed. So my research is based on an exploratory casual design as there's no prior research on Alatuna Creek, but I wanted to discover the, re the relationship between schools opening and water health. I conducted a paired T test, which is recommended for a small sample size. However, my data was not randomly selected, so I cannot general generalize any results to the entirety of the Etowah River watershed. And due to the casual nature of um, the research, no definite conclusions can be drawn. I also have to assume that there are no, um, there's no influence from unnatural variables besides the school's opening. Um, I use the adopt the stream collection process twice a week at each site to observe Palatina Creek. So as mentioned before, I did become a certified volunteer, volunteer and I followed their procedures for monitoring to create comparable data. I first measured the temperature of the air and water using the thermometer, and I measured conductivity through the meter. pH um, and dissolved oxygen were both measured in the field with the reagents, and I ran each test twice to um, ensure matching results, and then took the mean um, and then recorded the mean. And before running the paired t-test on the pH, dissolved oxygen and conductivity of each site, sites, I conducted a Shapiro-Wilkes test for normality. This is a required um, condition for t-test and an adequate test for my small sample size. So here are the means before and after schools open at each site. As you can see at sites two and three, Dissolved oxygen did not follow its expected relationship with temperature as it did at site one. pH had minimal change at all three sites and conductivity increased. So the um, difference between means though was not significant uh, to conclude a school's opening changed the chemical properties of Alatuna Creek. So at site one, this is expected as it um, was upstream from schools. Site three was expected to have the greatest change, but this was not shown. Uh, the very slight change in pH connects to a prior study uh, regarding concrete surfaces, but there was no parking lots or impervious surfaces built during the time of observation. So as stated before, dissolved oxygen did not follow its inverse relationship with temperature at sites two and three, but this could also be due to the excess leaves in the stream. However, it's um, unclear which relationship had the greater pull. So there was an increase of ions at all three sites, but there is no indicator of why. While these results do not illuminate a certain issue, the data does provide a strong basis for the future. 
Um, the results are kind of like a double-edged sword though. Although it supports that schools aren't polluting the creek, we still don't know what is causing the lack of macroinvertebrates. So my study only evaluated the short-term and immediate effects of schools opening. Pollutants can reach water at different times. So a longer study, a longer term study would um, be able to capture more of the usual lifestyle. I was also to, um, unable to answer my supporting question of over the influence of temperature and as compared to pollutants. This would need a much larger study to evaluate the extent of that relationship. However, my um, research and data does provide a strong foundation for the knowledge of Alatuna Creek. Um, the schools along Alatuna Creek could use this data to emphasize need for greener practices and environmental conservation. However, it is in no way supporting the current land usages and practices and their effects. So I would like to give a huge thanks to my mentor for being willing and eager to adapt to this new style of internship, as well as my teachers through Kennesaw Mountain who guided me through this process. Here are my references. Thank you for your time. And are there any questions? Awesome job, Annabelle. That uh, that hit close to home for me because I also went to Kennesaw Mountain and I grew up by Alatoona Creek. So I know exactly like I see those photos and I'm like, yep, there's no macros in there don't know what's going on. Um, so I really enjoyed that. That was really cool that, you know, you were able to monitor it. Um, I know it was only for a short time for like the semester, um, but that's still, you know, hopefully they can continue monitoring it. And like you said, the need for long-term data, um, that would be really, really beneficial. So great job. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Annabelle? Are you planning on continuing conducting any monitoring or are you are you kind of done for that? Um, with school starting back up, I was on a very rigorous monitoring schedule um, due to internship because I was like my internship. Um, but with school starting up, I've only been able to monitor two sites so far. Um, but it's still really interesting to see the data kind of um, change with the temperatures because I've never done this before. So yeah. Awesome. Are you interested in going into like environmental sciences or um, how did you get started with your internship like that? Um, so my internship was uh, kind of like just I happened upon it and it turned out to be the greatest thing. Um, it's really opened my eyes to the need for environmental conservation. <clears throat> I plan on studying um, chemical engineering at Georgia Tech. Um, but I would like to go into the uh, alternative energy field right now. That seems like a good pathway for me. So definitely. And there's a need for that, you know. Let's see. I saw something come up in the chat. Um, Amanda has some really good comment for you. Uh, just overall, good job uh, reflecting on the limitations of the short term nature of the process. So good job. Any questions for our presenter? Hey, Annabelle, it's Mike. Hey. Uh, I do have a question. I'm familiar with the sites, of course. Um, did you, when you were out there at all four, did you notice a difference between how silted in they were, like how much sediment were in those four locations? You mean like just in general? Yeah, how much, like, yeah, I know you didn't measure it or anything, but habitat being filled in with sand and um, I only noticed it at site three, which was the burnt hickory site. Um, I found that after storms each um, time, the little islands in the center would definitely become more silted. So yeah, that was the only site I really noticed that. So I guess that's good. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Okay. So congratulations on Georgia Tech. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Good job. All right, well, thank you so much, Annabelle, for your wonderful presentation. Thank we'll you. go ahead and move on to the next presenter. Yep. So our 
Final presenter for the evening is Amy Pham, and she's here with us. She entered in on the high school level uh, with Elite Scholars Academy, which is also Adopt a Stream, uh, is a certified Adopt a Stream group. So let me get you set up here, Amy, so that you can share your screen. And whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Okay. Oh, I didn't even share. Oh my gosh. I'm sorry. Okay, everything good? Okay. Hello everyone, my name is Amy Pham and I go to Lee Scholars Academy. And uh, to start off everything, I want you guys to just uh, go back to a time where you guys just thought about uh, plastic pollution. And then you saw an ad and it said, uh, oh, this product degrades, um, you know, in less time than another product. So say 40 years instead of a thousand years, I bet everyone's heard this in uh, how, you know, uh, degradable it is in terms of um, envir environmental sustainability. And then, um, so what does this word degrade actually mean? In reality, it just means that they, they get smaller in uh, a slower or a more rapid amount of time. And how do these microplastics and these nanoplastics act actually affect the environment in terms of water quality and then organisms? And that was basically like the main uh, you know objective of my study was to see to quantify the difference in number of microplastics in point and non point sources of pollution in Metro Atlanta. And I chose uh, Metro Atlanta because uh, that's basically where I am. And uh, my community is uh, low income and we don't have uh, too many resources around us. And I wanted to specifically zone in into uh, Clayton County because, uh, you know, the conditions that, are, that we're in and to see how it actually affects my community and the water streams that are in it. And there's only one that's, that's outside, which is Ch Chattahoochee River, but it was such a like, substantial water source I had to include it. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so the question was, what is the discrepancy between the number of microplastics in point and non-point sources of pollution per liter, and is water quality affected by the number of microplastics in the source of water? And then I hypothesized that uh, point sources of pollution would have a higher amount of higher concentration of microplastics due to, uh, you know, how concentrated it is, uh, because point sources of pollution tend to be smaller, while non-point sources of pollution tend to be, uh, you know, larger in a wide, wider scale. And then I also uh, say, hypothesized that water quality be, would be lower in terms of the number of microplastics in this. The water quality would be lower if there's more microplastics in the source due to the fact that um, these microplastics have been studied and they've been shown to be toxic vectors of harmful bacteria, you know, toxins and other you know, things of that sort. So that will affect the chemical makeup of the waterway. Okay, so the project objectives were to confirm that there are microplastics in the water A, then to enumerate the number of microplastics per source, and then to determine whether point or non-point sources of pollution contain more microplastics. And this is more into like, uh, what are some of the ways to treat the, the water, the waterway, um, because of you know the differences that it has between the point and non-point sources of pollution, and whether uh, it affects the organisms in those waterways. Uh, because of uh, the source of pollution that there is, because if there's more, uh, if there's more microplastics in one uh, type of source of pollution, then that's going to um, affect the organisms and how they might uh, consume it or uh, you know digest it in those sorts of uh, things factors, and then uh, finally to detect whether there is a correlation in the health of the waterway, in water quality and the number of microplastics. So a little bit of a breakdown on microplastics. There are actually two types. One is commercialized as small little plastics, and you can see these in beauty products um, in the form of microbeads. And uh, some of the ways I've seen it is in like face scrubs. And then um, the other uh, the other type is for degraded from larger plastics. And that is what I was mentioning in the beginning on how larger plastics can degrade into smaller and smaller and smaller uh, size classes. And then they are ubiquitous. In studies, they have been found in atmospheric deposition, which means that they're like circulating around the air around us. And then it can travel from from soil into pl actually into plant roots. So we're um, they're they're seen in like plants as well. And then uh, they're found in gastrointestinal tracts of organisms. And that means that if we're actually consuming any of these micro um, these animals, we're actually consuming microplastics as well. And I've actually I've actually seen that some studies have shown that they're found in beer, which is a common. Uh, you know, 
beverage that people drink. And then uh, there's not enough research on them, which means that there is no standardized methods to quantify and identify them in any medium, whether that be water, soil, or air. So that was um, so a part of my limitations that I had because there was no uh, way to like base it off of like a standardized method to uh, research and identify them. Um, I had uh, to, you know, look at the recommendations from the N um, O N O A, and then, or is it N O O A? But <laughs> other studies imply that there should be uh, more research on them, and I definitely agree after what I've done in my research. So the variables I have are non point sources of pollution and point sources of pollution, and I actually got this, these two, uh, the difference between these two uh, from Adopted Stream because I did not know what that was before, which is part of the reason why uh, this is in my uh, like project design. And then points, non point sources of pollution are contaminants that are from a wide area that cannot be pinpointed from multiple sources. So these sources of pollution come from like different sources, and you can't really know how to treat them because you don't know re really what it is and how it came there. And then a point source of pollution that's kind of the opposite. It is when you can actually pinpoint and track to where uh, the sources of pollution actually came from and then sort of treat it because you know what it is and where it came from. And then the two uh, variables of water quality parameters that I chose were pH and dissolved oxygen because of uh, the way it's you know universal and how they can indicate this, um, the health of the waterway. Um, pH of uh, you know, it's determined, it's used to determine the acidity or basicity of aqueous, aqueous solution, and then the dissolved oxygen is the amount of uh, gaseous oxygen that is dissolved in the water. So then to isolate my microplastics from each sort of each source, I sieved them in three different classes, uh, class size. It was 400 uh, microns, 60 microns, and 30 microns, and in the size classes between those. And then I digested them with wet peroxidation using a hydrogen peroxide. And then I placed them in the incubator uh, for about a 20, 24 plus or minus a one hour uh, for the uh, all the organic matter to digest and to just, uh, you know, break down. And then I densely separated them using sodium iodide um, to, you know, to increase the density of the solvent so that the plastics would float and then the organic matter would settle. And then I used an equation that I did not include in this, but used an equation to be able to determine the right density that I wanted, which is about 1.8 grams per cubic centimeter, and um, um, that would that would separate the densities in terms of uh, plastics and organic matter. And then I vacuum filtered them with a Buchner filter, and I looked at them under a micro microscope, um, and then I tested them whether to see if they were uh, plastics or not using uh, like a hot needle, and plastics would like curl while like, organic matter would not. So then uh, for the pH and dose option, I used the adoptive stream methods, uh, which was wide range indicator and color comparator boxes for pH, and then the SI modification of the Winkler method for the dissolved oxygen. And for the controls, I had two filter uh, and dissolved water blanks, uh, and then they went through the, uh, the filtration process of the uh, methods for microplastics identification while the other two field blanks uh, were collected at the site of the um, of two of two of the sites. Uh, one was point non, one was non point. And then um, they went through the entire process of the isolation of microplastics. So these are just some of the pictures that I have. Uh, the first one right here is a 60 micron sieve of water of a water sample that I did. And then this one over here is the digestion through wet peroxide oxidation. Um, this is the hot plate and the, uh, you know the setup, and then this is the density separation. Um, uh, these were left for about seven hours to be able to uh, you know fully separate in the densities, and then this is the vacuum filtration that I used for uh, to filter out the microplastics. And then these are the study sites that I used: uh, the Flint River and the Chattahoochee River. Though those are both uh, non-point sources of pollution. And then the Indian Lake and the watershed in Clayton State were both um, point sources of pollution. Uh, as you can see, they're a, l a lot more concentrated uh, compared to these other uh, sources over here uh, for the non-point. Um, th these two are both uh, identified as, as drinking water or recreational uh, type of waterways, uh, which means that they, uh, they're used for, wa for drinking water. But then they also have other uses, such as the Chattahoochee River, um, you know, a lot of the activity around it, um, there's a lot of like power plants and uh, industrial factories. 
somewhere around them, which means that uh, there's a lot of pollutants that actually go into these waterways. While these two, um, for the watershed in Clean State, um, there has been a little bit of construction while I did my study. And the Indian Lake, um, there was a drain pipe like right next to where I was sampling the water. So then uh, this is a picture of the uh, one of the micro microfibers that I found on um, one of the sites. And it was about 40 microns, which is pretty small. So uh, microplastics are plastics that are like uh, under five millimeters, which is about the size of a pencil eraser. So 20 microns is like a lot taller than that. And then the results were that the hypothesis was inconclusive. Uh, this is because of a variety of factors, but some were just uh, that the p-values that I did for the one-way ANOVA test and the t-test for microplastic difference was greater than 0 .0, 0 0.05, which means that it wasn't statistically significant. Um, and then also uh, because of the way that the difference in the uh, number of microplastics from each site, uh, it ranged from 13 to 17 particles, whether they be non-porn or point source solution, they did not have a great variance, meaning that, um, you know, there wasn't as big of a difference as I wanted it to be. Um, and then, the, but there was some, uh, you know, hint that point source solution had a higher amount of microplastics because the average or the mean of it was higher, even though it wasn't really significant. So which is why I concluded it as to be inconclusive. And then I also uh, tested the microplastics type, size, and color, and if they were independent from their site, and I used the Fisher exact test. And then the result of that was that it was greater than 0.05, which means that they were independent from the site, meaning that uh, it did not depend on the site on how, uh, you know, frequent the micro microplastic uh, type, color, and size were actually found. But then, but they were actually, they were still there and they were still present, so which is still a concern. And the pH and dissolved oxygen levels, uh, they displayed that point source pollution had worse levels of, of, wa of water quality than non-point source pollution. And the p-values are actually less than uh, 0.05, which made it significant. But uh, it, it's going to be talked more about in the discussion. So these are just some of the graphs that I have. Uh, the first one here on the left is a microplastic abundance. Um, it just, uh, you know, shows you the controls over here on the two on the left and then the two on the right are the i mean two on the right for the controls and two on the left on the for the point on point source solution so this is the microplastic abundance this is the relative abundance of microplastic color so they're separated by you know they're actually colored coordinated um the green is the green the red is red and it's just like the percentage of how much there were in each one and then the relative abundance of microplastic type so there's only fragments and fibers that were found, so uh, that's why you only see yellow and gray. And then the relative abundance of microplastic size, the three classes are here. Um, I think this is supposed to be purple, but I messed that up, sorry. But yeah, so there are the three t uh, size classes and then the dissolved oxygen and pH levels. So the two on the left are the um, non-point source of pollution and then the two on the right, which is the gray and the yellow are the point sources of pollution. And you can tell that these uh, are have like lower standards of water quality. Um, so the pH uh, for the GAEPA, uh, the levels that are uh, suggested for the type of water quality, water way it is, it should be about uh, six to eight, which is, they're all in the standard, but then the, uh, uh, the actual differences in them, the, non-point sources of pollution had uh, lower levels. And you can see this here with the dissolved oxygen uh, levels being lower in the point sources of pollution. So because of the way that the different, uh, the different, you know, contamination of microplastics can actually enter the water quality, the water samples that I had, I had to use a little bit of quality control to be able to, uh, you know, control how much that could actually enter the Micro uh, the water samples. So then I sterilized all the bottles and beakers. All the surfaces were disinfected with isopropyl alcohol, and then all equipment was either metal or glass when it could be to prevent any like uh, contamination in terms of plastic containers. And then all samples were covered with aluminum foil when it could be. Um, 
and then water, water collection bottles were actually collected under the water and then capped under the water. So there wouldn't be any uh, microplastic contamination in terms of the air. And then only 100% cotton clothing was worn because of, um, you know, uh, acrylic, polyester, and fleece. They all are uh, have concentrations of plastic, so it could actually uh, affect the results. So the discussion, uh, the amount of microplastics that I found in my study were a lot higher than other uh, published studies with a higher score of quality control, but they were usually caught with a net and the flow of water could actually push these microplastics out. And, um, you know, uh, mine were grab samples, so there wasn't any net or force of water could actually push these microplastics out. The controls had a much lower abundance of microplastics, the average, uh, the approximate average between all the uh, controls that I had, which were four, were two plus or minus 0 0.71 standard deviation per liter. And the point source pollution had a higher average of microplastics and had worse levels of water quality according to Georgia EPA, um, even though they were in the standard, which I explained a little bit before. And then many other factors could affect pH and EO in terms of um, the, you know, the time of day, the temperature. And that's why I sort of, um, my, I rejected it because of how the all the other factors that could affect it, which um, is why it prompted me to, if I were to do other studies, I would have um, a more controlled environment. And then limitations due to COVID-19, there was not enough resources in terms of how many samples that I could actually do because of, uh, you know, all the entire process that it had with the sodium iodide and hydrogen peroxide that was a strain on like a cost. And if I were to do this again, I would um, do it over a longer period of time, more samples, more blanks to be able to ensure like a greater precision in, uh, you know, a very uh, like, like it, like being precise in reliable data. And then I, I always mention one, one liter, which is also placed into not enough resources. Um, and then there was limited data, which means that, uh, you know, there isn't a standardized method and a way to con compare whether your methods were uh, were accepted and then there was no access to research lab which uh, decreased the amount of uh, which increased the amount of contamination that could have been affected into the study so then for further studies i actually wanted to uh, be able to address any uh, microplastics effects on other organisms uh, mainly invertebrates um, and then maybe look into the possible effects that it has on biogeochemical chemical cycles in terms of, um, you know, carbon because of how uh, actually fecal pe pellets that contain these microplastics, it, it has a lower ability to uh, reach like lower depths of the ocean, which uh, the, sequ the, the sequestered uh, carbons don't actually go to the lower amount of lower depths of the ocean, which is interesting and something that I would look into. So the implications are that they are confirmed that microplastics are pervasive in our environment, and then all sites displayed microplastic pollution. And then this research was done to possibly know the difference in how to treat the pollution in terms of the difference in the point and non-point source pollution. And then it could have impacts on e ecology depending on the abundance and how uh, do they affect us and the organisms in, uh, you know, further, further as time develop, uh, goes on and, you know, plastics becomes more uh, pervasive and more, uh, we become more dependent on it. And then it is an emerging topic that needs much more literature to fully understand its effect on the environment, the organisms, and their polluters, which are humans. And the picture here is from uh, the picture from Indian Lake and uh, you know there, there are obvious signs that there are plastics in the water, in specifically microplastics. And that is it. Thank you for listening. And do you guys have any questions? Great presentation, Amy. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or unmute yourself. So. I'm sorry if I missed this, but like, what was your control samples? Uh, my control samples were, uh, I used distilled water. So mm -hmm. uh, I did two controls that were to determine if there was any microplastic contamination in the filter and the dissolved water uh, to see mm -hmm. like if there were any uh, microplastics that were in those factors. 
And then they went through the filtration process with the Buchner filter. And then the other two were fill blanks. So then they were collected at the site mm -hmm. of the actual uh, water sample with it, like right next to it. And then they went through the entire process uh, with the uh, isolation of microplastics. And so you found microplastics in the distilled water. Yes. And that was a lower number than people normally find in their field blanks. Um, <laughs> That's crazy. Yes. I think that it was a bit higher. Like most of the other controls, they had like less, less than one. Because I think it's because they had like a larger uh, sample size, which is one of the flaws that I had in my study. Uh, I didn't have enough, like a big enough sample size or as much controls, which is something I would actually alter if I were to do this again. That was very eye opening. It was also eye opening the rainbow of colors of all the different plastics. Good job. That was a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, we do have a question from Betty. Uh, she wanted to tell you brilliant research design. And how did you, she wants to know, how did you come up with it? Um, and are you sure you're not working on your PhD? Ha ha ha, little joke, love it. Um, thank you. And um, I came up with it because of like, mm, okay. So it kind of started in the eighth grade when I did a project on Daphnia and its effect on pharma, um, pharmaceuticals and their effect on water quality in uh, Daphnia. And, um, you know, I, I noticed that there were like floating little, you know, white, smaller plastic looking things. And I was really interested on uh, what they were and, you know, how it came about. So then I looked into more into about plastics and the, the microplastics and then all the scary stuff and how it affects the organisms and then like the larger scale plastics. And then I went to a war poll into how micro, uh, microplastics, the nanoplastics, you know, more and more, 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 more plastics. So then, um, so then the other part of it was I wanted to look into microplastics already, but then when I joined uh, Dr. Stream, I learned ab about how uh, what non-point and point sources of pollution were. So then I uh, looked into that and then I looked into the different studies that the, uh, you know, was already, that were already published on microplastics and their abundance. And since there isn't like a standardized method, I really focused in on like those peer review journals that I uh, saw which ones were more uh, effective. So then I kind of based it off of uh, those on like taking some things out and other things in. Uh, based on the av availabilities of my resources and which is a lot about like how I came up with everything. Um, I think I think I just missed this in your PowerPoint, um, but can you quickly just go over what were the types of microplastics that you were looking at? Because you looked at it by color, by size, and then you said by type. Oh, yeah. OK, types is like basically like whether it be a micro bead, a micro foam, a micro, a micro plastic, like a fragment of a, of, of like a larger piece, but then it's like, it's like, like a irregular polygon looking. Type. Yeah, like a little broken chip almost. And then in my study, I only found microfibers in fragments. Mm, okay, interesting. I know on the coast, um, there's a woman named Doty who's been doing a lot of work on microplastics out there. And she said that microfibers were like the number one thing that she's found just from laundry and stuff like that. So it's interesting that you kind of found the same thing. Yeah. Do we have any further questions for, for Amy? I have one question, <laughs> no, one, no one's going to ask one um, real quick. Uh, for your future studies, you said you wanted to look at the effects on invertebrates specifically. Um, I just wanted to know why that is. Are you just interested in inverts or is there, you know, a bigger reason why? I think it's mainly because I'm uh, just interested in them because I did this I think I mentioned it before, but I did a, a project with my did with Daphnia, and it was it was it was really really captivating because of you know how their carcass is like trans transparent, so you can see like all their organ organ organs and stuff, 
and um, I was looking into how it might affect their, uh, you know, ingestion in terms of if they were like presented with algae and then microplastics in it, uh, which one would they like actually choose to actually consume and whether the, if there was like a definite uh, difference between which source they would actually consume. Gotcha. Well, thank you, Amy. Well, that wraps it up for tonight. It's eight o'clock. So uh, thank you to all of our presenters, a big virtual round of applause for all of you. Um, fantastic presentations and research. And um, yeah, I just, I can't wait to see what future studies come out of this. So very exciting. Um, we'll wrap it up before we go to our informal network session. Um, so if you don't already, be sure to follow Georgia Adopt a Stream on Instagram and Facebook to keep up with all of the events we'll have uh, coming up in the year. And also be sure to check out more Confluence sessions. Uh, we have, what is today? Today's Wednesday. Um, so we still have the rest of the week for great lunchtime sessions and a few evening social sessions. Um, so the link for that will be in the chat. We also have our Wonder of Water weekend where we encourage you to get outside and participate in a monitoring event or clean up a stream or just spend the day out by water. Um, and of course, all these sessions will be posted on our YouTube page as well and on our website. Great, yeah, and I posted all of the links that she just mentioned in the chat. Um, I also posted a link to a survey, so we'd love to hear your thoughts on all of our sessions um, and how we're doing. We, we'd love to hear your feedback, so um, please fill that out. We'd really appreciate that. Um, as always, if you're interested in learning more about adopt a stream and would like to get involved, or if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us as well. Um, I also put our email in the chat. Um, and also we have adopt a stream t-shirts um, that we are putting out as part of Confluence. So uh, again, if you have not ordered a t-shirt, um, definitely check it out because we think that they're pretty snazzy. Um, so thank you again, everybody for joining us tonight.